Thank you to everyone who came out to my last workshop all about how to reach out when you're feeling like a burden. And I think this is going to be one of those workshops that I do more frequently live to get more feedback and get better at talking on this topic in particular. Um, it's very nuanced. There's so much to talk about there. Everything from attachment to communication style and skills and emotions that come up and all of that. So I love talking about it. And if you're interested in coming to a live workshop so you can ask questions, that would be awesome. I will keep you updated about when that's coming up. Therapists and other helping professionals who want to do longer, more intensive one-on-one -on -one work with clients. Um, this is something that I've started moving into and I absolutely love doing therapy intensives. Um, you can do this if you're a therapist, OT, PT. I know that some of you listen to this podcast um, and do really great work with clients, especially already in group formats. Um, but for those who kind of want more in-depth targeted individualized work a therapy intensive is perfect and you can learn all about this in stephanie feld therapy intensive summit it's may 13 to 16 and i'm speaking there all about chronic pain and illness intensives it's a free four-day event so there's a bunch of us talking and some of the other topics that people are going to be talking about include intensives with psychedelic psychotherapy, um, betrayal, trauma, relationship counseling, having a social justice-centered practice, um, inner child work, financial strategies for therapists um, with Jenny Schlottmiller. She's awesome. I love being in her membership as well because she just is so knowledgeable about all things taxes and therapy. She's a therapist and CPA herself. So I'm really excited for that. Um, there's a lot of people talking here. So grab that free ticket, even if you're not sure which ones you can make it to. The ticket's free, so go ahead and grab that. And then if you decide that you want to upgrade to the VIP All Access Pass, that pass is $127. And that will allow you to have access to all of these videos after the summit is over so you can watch it at your own pace. And a private podcast feed of all the presentations so that you don't have to kind of sit at your computer. You can also listen to it on the go. Um, you'll get presentation notes and a workbook, and you'll also have a chance to interact with some of the summit speakers during live panels each day. Um, each day, there's going to be panels that are exclusive to the VIP all access pass holders. So if that's of interest to you, um, the people talking there will be talking about how to host retreats, integrating intensives with other healing modalities like yoga, nature, music, all of that, um, offering couples therapy intensives, building an intensive only practice, um, developing multiple streams of income, and BIPOC therapists building wealth. So those are just some of the topics. Um, there will also be a live meditation and chances to be coached, as well as some seriously amazing resources that the VIP speakers have all contributed to the intensive. So if you're a VIP access pass holder, again, that's 127. All of the materials that you'll get access to individually bought add up to about $4,000. Things like the roadmap to retreat planning with Patrick Casal. Amber Lydia has a resource around time management and profit in your practice. Um, we're talking betrayal, trauma in the therapy room, and how to diversify your income with Michelle Risser. Also, letters to my inner child from Micah Miller. How cool. That's awesome. So again, the actual summit is free, but if you want all these extra resources and more time to watch the videos, then please feel free to use the link down in my description box to sign up for that. The Chronic Illness Therapist podcast is meant to be a place where people with chronic illnesses can come to feel heard, seen, and safe while listening to mental health therapists and other medical professionals talk about the realities of treating difficult conditions. This might be a new concept for you, one in which you never have to worry about someone inferring that it's all in your head. We dive deep into the human side of treating complex medical conditions and help you find professionals that leave you feeling hopeful for the future. I hope you love what you learned here and please consider leaving a review or sharing this podcast with someone you love. This podcast is meant for educational purposes only for specific questions related to your unique circumstances, please contact a licensed medical professional in your state of residence.
Mark is a clinical assistant professor at Midwestern University in Glendale, Arizona. He specializes in spine and persistent pain conditions and works in a clinic where he sees patients and mentors physical therapy students. He also runs Modern Pain Care, a company focused on educating healthcare professionals on pain science and person-centered healthcare. He hosts the Modern Pain Podcast, where he interviews clinicians, researchers, and patients to better help everyone understand and manage their pain. So, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Um, I found you because I don't remember exactly. I think I was just looking at podcasts who also um, talk about chronic pain, came across your podcast, Modern Pain Pro, and then now you have this really cool um, community that you're building. So, We can talk about that um, throughout this episode too, but maybe just start by introducing yourself, letting us know who you are, where you work, and all that fun stuff. Sure. Uh, My name is Mark Cargill. I'm a physical therapist of 20 years. I've been practicing primarily in like orthopedics. And um, as I grew in my career, it became really apparent that there was about 10 to 20% of my practice that did not respond to traditional physical therapy where we were just focusing on you know, muscles, joints, bones, you know, strength and all these things, which can be important. And it's still part of the picture for a lot of people, but um, left me very frustrated and on a journey to kind of, you know, passionately try to figure out how do I help these people? Because I was like in this, I want to help everybody, right? We all want to help everybody we see. Obviously, we know that's probably not going to happen. But that kind of motivation put me on this pursuit. And I went through kind of a lot of advanced training in physical therapy along my career where I ended up in a fellowship which was really aimed around manual therapy, which was, I thought at the time, initially getting into it, it was just going to be this new way to kind of really figure it out by having these really amazingly complex skills to, to assess and, and find pain within the tissues and treat it within the tissues. And it actually was very frustrating in that situation because I was seeing a lot of my mentors who were mentoring me through my fellowship process and they were having the same 10 to 20 percent in their practice that I was like man I got into this for that 20 percent that I'm still seeing failing in their practice but within that program I also got exposed to uh, a pain science course which really kind of was this aha moment for me where I really made sense why trying to just strictly aim at tissues for a very complex issue, which is pain really is going to fall short for, uh, you know, 10 to 20% of people where pain really escapes, you know, tissue, strictly tissue explanations. Although we embody all of what we experience mentally, physically, our whole biopsychosocial existence will be embodied within our body. We may talk about that, of course, but um, so as I've gotten out of that fellowship, that was where my passion to really start digging into pain science, you know, took hold and I read everything I could get my hands on, listened to podcasts, um, bothered a lot of smart people who were really into it and um, was fortunate to get to work with Adrian Lowe, who's a pretty, uh, you know, authority figure and pretty, you know, huge kind of legend, I guess you could say in the pain professions. Um, he, I was working for a company that he partnered with that we helped bring on his therapeutic pain specialist program. I was able to help bring that online with him and uh, taught a little bit in that program, but then just decided I I love Adrian still really have high respect for his stuff and still talk to him from time to time, but wanted to kind of strike out on my own and not have to worry about, you know, if I was teaching it a different way or, you know, I'd have a bunch of a big company around me where there was just kind of a, I don't know, company line where you had to tell it to to make sure you don't say this not negatively about this intervention, even because we teach it or, or different things. So I ended up starting modern pain care, which is then where the modern pain podcast struck out from where I just, it it was kind of a selfish pursuit, really, I just wanted an excuse to talk to smart people and be able to like, pick their brains and, and learn myself, but also just get the information out. I know probably you and your listeners know that there is just a gross misunderstanding and we don't do patients justice and a good majority of our uh, pro- healthcare professionals, physicians, physios uh, don't understand nor treat pain in a more modern fashion. We're all trained very traditionally. Um, some physician groups or the programs, they get like 12 hours of it in an entire three to four year program. So um, that just goes to show where we just aren't meeting the mark. So podcasts like yours and mine, hopefully we can help change and get some information out there to help the public, you know, better handle some of this, challenge that is around chronic pain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. My, my podcast is really geared at kind of that self critical piece that I think keeps people stuck. Um, and, uh, trying to help people get more into the physical side, um, knowing that the two have to be connected. So I think this is it. I kind of love, um, 
this collaboration here because you're you're physical and you're trying to bring that mental piece in and then I'm mental and trying to bring that physical piece in so um yeah I would love to kind of talk a little bit more about maybe just a little bit more about your um philosophy maybe even like when you left and started your own clinic like what were some of the things that you were like this is what I really want to do here yeah, I haven't actually started my own clinic. I work at a university right now. I work at as, as a full-time clinician, clinical assistant professor. So I really try to ingrain a little bit of this into our training. It's it's a little tough just because our our requirements for our profession, as with all of them, don't haven't really fully encompassed yeah. what we need to have these folks know about pain. But I try to help them understand that it's not, um, you know, very. You can't just look at a person through their x-ray and MRI and tissues. That's often what gets people disengaged with the healthcare system because that grossly invalidates a lot of the challenging experience that goes around pain when, when x-rays you know, don't change, yet pain is getting worse, or x-rays or MRIs supposedly look good, yet patients' are, lives are getting significantly worse. So my big philosophy has been just to bring the humanity back to healthcare because I think sometimes, especially with some of the healthcare system challenges that we see. I, I talk to patients regularly who barely get to talk to their physician. They get cut off within, you know, a minute of speaking and they don't really get to tell their story and they get basically attempted to be categorized in these nice, neat di diagnostic buckets, which oftentimes they don't fit. Um, and then physicians sometimes, because they don't understand and don't have the training to really dig down to the complexity. And this isn't just physicians, this is physios and pretty much majority of healthcare professionals. Um, and then patients get frustrated, clinicians get frustrated, and oftentimes patients disengage from healthcare, which I would too if I was going through some of the challenging stuff and feeling like nobody's listening and nobody's validating their experience. So trying to really bring that patient expertise to the encounter, I think we grossly underestimate that we have an expert sitting across from us every time we sit down and have the privilege of working with somebody in pain, um, that they are the only expert in their unique experience, what they've gone through, how it feels to them, what they've lost in regards to their pain. So um, trying to help clinicians understand that. And often, as you're well aware, with your behavioral mental health practice, understanding some of the negative cognitions and stressful emotional experiences and things that really influence our central nervous system due to the stress and distress that that pain um, often brings to people, it can really impact how your body behaves because of this whole delineation of the mind-body separation. It, it may exist in textbooks, but it sure doesn't exist in real life. It sure doesn't exist with real people. Um, and yeah. that's been my hope is to try to help bridge those two, just like you're doing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. How can you talk more about how movement plays into um, recovering from chronic pain? And, and then we can kind of also bring in that piece of, you know, this 10 to 20 percent of patients that don't tend to um, find any benefit and then maybe kind of what what you do, what you would do with with them. Sure. Sure. Um, so what was the first part? I'm sorry. I'm that's okay. Um, more like talking to the physical side of okay. managing chronic pain, okay. not so much from that medicalized perspective. Cause I think we all have an understanding of like, we've all at one point been told like, just go to PT and like do the exercises and then go home. And then like, yeah, it doesn't, we don't find any benefit in it. So I'm curious from your approach, knowing that you are working from like that lens of this isn't going to work for everyone. What does a movement protocol look like if someone were working with you? So that's, that's a good question. Movement has taken a significantly different kind of, I guess, view of it. Um, I think there are times where people might be moving in a way that might not be helpful for them. And, um, often it's not how we traditionally think, right? Cause if, if we take back pain, for instance, which is a common chronic pain issue is we, if you Google anything around back pain, it's like you got to have core stability and core strength. So we get these people just bracing and tensing the tar out of their your, their abs and their glutes yeah. and everything. And and often when we look at the research around chronic pain, the way we can often see who has chronic pain and who doesn't, if we just take people off the streets and we don't know, is people with chronic pain often move much more restrictively. They move with much more tension because they don't trust their bodies oftentimes. And it's oftentimes because we've given them scary messages. I always say I'm a reformed kind of movement therapist as far as I, we, I talk about, I used to put people in movement jail of like, you have to move a certain way and there's only a certain safe way to move. And we really get these folks in this box of very fearful movement, which furtherly makes the pain worse. I mean, I always give the example of my patients, it's like try to move your wrist with a clenched fist and see how good that's gonna feel after a while, like really clench it hard and start moving your fist. 
yet this is the narrative that gets often thrown to people around movement um, and pain is you got to tighten, you got to protect, you got to brace. And oftentimes people are plenty protective over their bodies because they've had a rotten experience with movement. They haven't really, often we, we talk about kinesiophobia, which is just a fancy word of fear of movement that people have because they've moved, maybe moved in the past and and their back, you know, spasm and they drop to the floor or, or whatever it may be that they've really grown to distrust movement, which we, I try to structure movement, you know, individually to the person in front of me to see what their thoughts are on movement, what's been their experience with movement, not just saying, hey, you're a person with back pain, you're going to get core stability, because that's just what we do. It's saying, you know, because sometimes I the thing I do is try to unstabilize people because they're so tense, they need to learn breathing and relaxation and, and try to explore movement in a relaxed fashion where their body's not clenched and tense. And we try to do these things called behavioral experiments where patients can kind of hash it out themselves. It's not like I'm just sitting there lecturing them that you need to move this way or not this way. We try to create scenarios clinically where they get to explore it and they get to see, hey, that when I move that way, it definitely is a different experience. And I let them unpack it and say, well, hey, you move this way with, with a clenched fist. It feels this way when you move where you're breathing and you're relaxed and we kind of allow, we kind of take, you know, inventory of what you're thinking and all those things with, you know, acceptance commitment type stuff. Yeah. And they no, have these different yeah. experiences. It can be, you know, it's this behavioral experiment where they get this, you know, expectancy violation and they start teaching themselves and then we just kind of lead them there. And then it can be a, a pretty cool experience to see people like really take that and, and then just the exercises like, Hey, go do more of that at home, go more, do that in life. And we build up you know, the movements around whatever their life goals are to see if we can start getting them back to the things that, you know, pain is often taken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm hearing you're, you're testing like what, and you're inviting them to, um, again, be their own expert, like when you move this way, how does that feel? Um, mm -hmm. And understanding that there's fear, right? I think sometimes when you're a medical professional of any kind, when your client comes into the room with fear, we can often internalize that in a certain way of like, oh, and, and then I have to fix this, right? Like I have to give the perfect exercises. I have to do the perfect thing. And then that just actually exacerbates. Everyone now is like on this snowball of increasing fear. Somebody has to stay grounded and say like, no, we actually, there's a lot of trust in this room. We trust your body. We trust your mind. I trust myself and being able to stay with this discomfort and not spiral out as well with you um so that we can have some groundedness and actually like feel what works here mm -hmm. absolutely i think it's a collaborative effort right it used to be just a like this expert and uh, you know delivering we call it the old paternalistic way of healthcare, where it was just you have the expert who's just dictating lecturing down upon the patient yeah. raining down their expertise and again it's we can interject it and help them kind of make sense of things with our expertise and maybe our understanding of what we know about imaging findings in the back and things like that, mainly to help them de-threaten their situation and hopefully validate what they've gone through and what they're, why they may move this way. And again, it's been hard because I had to make a shift from being this lecturer and I still don't always hit the mark on it. I'm not going to say I'm perfect by any means, but to just really allow the patient and I'm just guiding to where they can ex do more experiential learning, more exploratory things. Um, and oftentimes if we can lay out the a scenario that they can explore, they can kind of, they find the way themselves if you allow them to. Um, but it often takes a lot of dealing with conflicts of past education, what the, what Dr. Google has, has told them. And there's just a lot of challenging information out there on social media and on the internet that, um, even from pretty high level institutions that I would say aren't really in line with what we know about current pain science and current things around like back pain and things like that. So it can be challenging for our patients for sure. Yeah. When you, um, when you work with somebody, well, okay. So I, we kind of touched a little bit on people who brace and, and are like mm -hmm. overly tight. Um, and that's definitely been my, that was my experience, like trying to move with a clenched fist, um, and learning to relax. But what about people who maybe are a little bit too loose, like their yeah. joints and their, like they actually need to learn to tighten up. How do you work with that? Yeah. So I work with a lot of like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome patients where hypermobility is a big thing. We work with folks throughout that hypermobility spectrum, um, some being formally diagnosed, some not. And I, th I think, again, these these ever, you know, and never ending quest to like neatly bucket people. I think everybody, we function on a spectrum, right? There's not a maybe one line that even though research draws a line, I don't think, again, humans maybe perfectly follow it. But folks with hypermobility, it's just, um, you know, again, helping them understand that, you know, with the laxity and things like that, they probably 
you know, shouldn't be doing things. And oftentimes those are folks who say, yeah, when I was in high school, I could do all these weird things with my shoulders or my hips. And, you know, we, we try to teach folks, you know, here's maybe some ways to move where you're not, you know, exposing the joints to extreme end ranges of movement where you might be subluxing or doing things with joints that, you know, can create some pain. Um, in that case, yes, I do think there's, there's some uh, grounds to do some, some strengthening and some mm -hmm. stabilizing, I think in, within context, right? Cause again, it, we don't want people moving just within neutral where they're, they're so fearful of their body that even when they're not in these ranges where the joints can get a little bit, you know, mobile and, and expose it, they're still clenching the fist. So again, it's strategic sta stability and strategic strength where you're helping them d develop strength around it. But then it, it's also too, you know, depending on what on board with sensitization if they're really sensitive around their joints you got to start small build slowly get people confident because oftentimes they may come from a history where exercise hasn't been the the best experience for them um and i think again as our as especially as a physical therapist that's obviously our bias is to just like you know we're, well you're going to exercise in here and it's not that we don't maybe get there eventually but it's sometimes people especially if they've had kind of negative experiences we we try to take it slow make sure they understand what the purpose is and, you know, let them start building confidence before we get into a full program, but definitely exercise strengthening for those folks. It, it kind of in these trying to train them around joint ranges that keep things from getting in sensitive positions that they, that their joints aren't really very, you know, happy with that they are experiencing significant pain with. And then, you know, teaching joint protection strategies where, Hey, maybe this movement where you're really extending and getting into end ranges that your shoulder or hip don't like, can we adapt some activities? Can we give you some strategies where, Hey, you still accomplish the goal and, and still are pointed towards the things that are meaningful to you in life, but we're not putting your body at, you know, to where you're beating yourself up to make it happen. So uh, yeah, it can yeah. be, it's a, it's a nuanced thing with everybody depending on what their unique situation is. Yeah. Yeah. There is so much education in that. And also just, yeah, understanding like defense mechanisms and the emotional side of things and fear. Right. Cause I mean, even especially with something like EDS, um, a lot of times you'll find like people who are able to extend in that way are proud of that. Right. And so they're proud of it. And then it also brings them pain at the same time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a very tricky balance of like, we're not trying to take anything away from your identity or what you're capable of, but it can feel that way when you start to maybe restrict that movement in order to then give them a better quality of, of body. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah. I think so, some patients, yeah, I agree. There are patients who really take that mobility as like a badge of honor, like something that, and it's not that they shouldn't be proud that they're, they've kept themselves healthy and moving, but it's another thing where trying to help people explore like, okay, you do these positions, you get into these extreme positions and what's your experience? What do you notice with your body after where again, they can kind of explore, well, like again, to, for us to just walk into that situation, Hey, stop doing that. Um, that's obviously work for people who are smoking and doing things. We just stop smoking. I mean, it's obviously a lot more complex than that. So helping create scenarios where people can explore, like, is that the best way if they want to keep moving towards things that are important to them? Yeah. And this is the reaction you're having when you do do those things. Is that still pointing you towards, you know, the life you want to live and the the movement goals you have and things like that. So it's tough though, especially, you know, there's some folks who are very big into the yoga stuff, which obviously can get pretty extreme in certain branches of it to where they're really, you know, exposing, you know, significant mobility and some people can control it and get through it, but, I, but that takes a lot of skill. And some people, especially if they have some genetic or hypermobility syndromes that are starting to merge with pain that may not be the best choice of, you know, activity. And then it becomes like, well, how do we still find some things that bring out your passion, bring out your, your fitness goals, but don't, you know, where your body's not paying the price for it. I like how you just worded that, how the hypermobil hypermobility syndrome can merge with pain, meaning it's not inherently this syndrome equals pain. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's people yeah. walking around with Ehlers Danlos that manage it very well that don't have a, a ton of pain. We, you know, you talk about resilience factors that we build in. Like, what what surrounds the Ehlers Danlos? Are you doing? You know, do you have good nutrition, good sleep? Are you metabolically healthy? I mean, there's a lot of things just from a general lifestyle medicine lifestyle health approach that can kind of buffer, I guess, your your joint. And you, and again, you're you're using good movement practices where you're not trying to force things into extremes or really you know, uh, I guess, expose your hypermobility to, you know, in ways that might you know, emerge because there is time. I mean, tissues 
still can be a primary source of why things hurt. But then again, that tissue message comes into an ecosystem that is the human being that, you know, depending on how metabolically healthy we are, like, and, and various other things, sleep, diet, um, you know, stress management, that determines how sensitive the system that it enters is. Like, you know, if you're poorly slept, you're going to have a pro-inflammatory profile. Oftentimes, you're, um, if your diet's full of processed carbs and things like that, oftentimes pro-inflammatory. If you're maybe carrying more adipose tissue, I mean, I hate, you know, I don't ever, I get frustrated because we often weight shame patients when they're dealing with chronic pain too. So that's another issue. But um, yeah. I think just helping people see the big picture around, you know, maybe their hypermobility condition and see, well, what are the modifiable factors within your life that we can do to just kind of point as many things, as many factors as we know, because there isn't a silver bullet factor, unfortunately, that's where mm -hmm. medicine tries to find that and then eternally frustrates patients because they never find it. And that's because we're complex. We're humans, man. There's a lot of things going on and a lot of things interacting. We, we teach physicians, we teach physios in this very narrow, you're an immunologist, you're a, a physiologist, you're a you know, psychologists where I just, the human body doesn't work that way. And then you get a lot of kind of piecemeal things where I always say, we're trying to talk about the forest where you have a lot of, you know, specific clinicians who are really, you know, focusing on one tree in a very complex forest. We try to teach people, you know, the more complexity, the ecosystem, the forest type approach of what they're dealing with. Cause oftentimes that can be hugely helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Even mental health, right. I think that's why a lot of yeah. us are bringing that physical side of things in because, um, it you tell somebody with anxiety like just change your thoughts about this or think differently in this way and it's like okay even if that works for a little while if they're not actively engaging with that thought in a way that's meaningful and and purposeful meaning physically moving um you, your body and your brain are just not going your brain's not going to hold on to that message in the same way yeah so, yeah i yeah. i think you definitely I, i've really through folks like yourself and others who have really incorporated the psychologically informed component within our care. That's been a big push within physio. I think we're still falling quite short on that front, but um, to really unpack, you know, what are the thoughts around your condition? What things come up in, in your emotions and your thoughts? You'll see people when they're starting to engage their bodies and, and do things, a lot of emotions come up. Like, and I used to just like, I had no idea how to react to those. Um, when people started getting teary eyed or getting really frustrated or emotional, I just kind of went back to what I was comfortable with. Like, okay, let's talk about, you know, the joint glide here at your, your shoulder joint or something that just was a, put me back in my security blanket because I didn't feel comfortable wading into that discussion. But I think the more people can see how their thoughts and emotions influence their body and, and influence, we embody, I always use the analogy of like, you put yourself in a haunted house and then notice your body in that situation and then put yourself on the most serene beach at sunset and you teleport yourself self there within a moment and see what, what do you think is different. And then oftentimes people live existences that are like a haunted house of like not knowing what's around the corner, what's going to happen with their body, how they're going to wake up tomorrow. Are they going to be able to perform their job? I mean, there's just a lot of scary things that people deal with that when people start seeing how that impacts their body, man, it can be a, a big game changer for a lot of people. I love that analogy of the haunted house. I've never thought about it like that. That is so true. You wait. Yeah. You never know what's around the corner. Yeah. I've had like uh, my friend, Corey Blickensef, he's another brilliant physio who's really kind of had a game on that. Talked about walking in a dark room and, and there's a lot of analogies that in stories that, you know, it's one of the things I, I don't even know if I came up with that, to be honest. I'm probably as with anything, we probably borrow it from a lot of our mentors and things like that. But um, yeah, I think any story that can just kind of resonate with the patient too, right? That, that kind of fits their worldview and fits how they kind of look at things. Like you might use different analogies for an engineer versus a, um, a you know, some folks who are very more analytical and other folks who, you know, you got to be creative with it, which is fun to me. I, that's the, we work yeah. with unique people that all have unique backgrounds and ways they look at things in ways that make sense to them to see what kind of resonates for that person in front of you becomes yeah. a challenge. Yeah. Um, in my particular style of therapy, we do a lot of, um, so I do somatic experiencing. And mm -hmm. so we're always looking at what the body is feeling. Um, and I do use the analogy of kind of like knowing your enemy. So I don't, I don't love the, um, to think about your pain as your enemy or to think about like that warrior fighting language. I'm not big on that, but it does feel like an enemy at first. Right. And so, okay, let's know your enemy. So we understand what the sensation feels like, what thoughts and images are associated with that image. 
what memories are associated with it. Slowly over time, we can start to decouple that is the word that we use where we just kind of, um, you know, it's almost like they're, they're, well, in acceptance and commitment therapy, it's fused, like they're fused mm-hmm. together. And we want to slowly start to separate those into two separate things. The image and the thought and the sensation are all separate instead of fused together. Um, but it's that same thing of like walking in a dark room or never knowing what's around the corner. So if we learn to like move our body more slowly, it's interesting. Cause like you're talking about these people who, um, move maybe pretty slowly in the sense that you can tell they kind of are braced more or that you can, you can tell when someone's like walking in pain, that kind of slow crouched, like braced movement. But I still think those people tend to be moving too fast for what their body wants. And we have to slow it down before we start to speed back up so that we're not constantly putting our bodies into this overdrive where we're like reaching our maximum limit, just walking to the mailbox. Instead, let's let's slow that all the way down. And then your body starts to learn safety. Um, So that's a mix that that concept is mixed with also what does this pain feel like? And if I know it, then I can attune to it. I can soothe it. I can be with it and not just try to like avoid it and push it down, which again, it feels a little bit counterintuitive in some of that, but it really is that slow down to speed up concept. Yeah. It kind of becomes this, the whole, like within acceptance commitment therapy, this whole noticing thing where you're just trying to notice what comes up when you're trying to move in these at a speed that may be beyond what do you notice in your heart rate? What do you notice in your tension? What do you notice? Um, you know, comes up in your thoughts and your emotions and things like that. And just, you know, seeing if people can unpack and maybe we can slow down and like you said, unfuse, de- defuse from some of these rigid thoughts and beliefs of like, oh my God, this is going to be the worst walk to the mailbox ever, or this, my, my back's going to go out, or I'm going to have a spasm, all these things that prime our system to be ready to react and to have some of these maybe real physical experiences that can be driven by fear. Again, I, you're, we're, I'm, I have real physical experiences when I'm walking through a haunted house and I'm sweating and my tension, my shoulders are locked up to my ears. I'm waiting for something to, to jump out from behind a you know a corner or something like that. And that's often how people move through life with some pain yeah. things. And it's not always because there's some people that don't have that maybe tension issues. So, but it can be helpful when people just kind of step, you know, as they're experiencing some of this haunted house thoughts and emotions and things where they can kind of take inventory of them, notice like you said, kind of defuse or kind of experience some of these things and see if they can kind of make some space to where those thoughts can still be present, yet they still find ways to move despite the, 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 you know, challenges of feeling like they're in a very uncertain situation. Can they still, you know, find their breath, you know, they still have that thought present and those concerns present because they often don't go away for people, but can you still navigate towards your goals and still learn how to control your body and learn how to move away from, the snowball, I say, rolling downhill when we, when we, you know, hook on those thoughts and let our body kind of roll down this kind of sympathetic cascade where it goes into, you know, fight or flight mode or, or some things that can create some of these protective experiences, which pain is a protective experience. It's a way our body, you know, protects us. It just can get way over protective, I guess you could say over time. I think that comes from the lack of mindfulness, just like in this culture, we're not, raised to be mindful beings. And so then that becomes a practice that a lot of us get into by choice. Um, But yeah, there's a mindfulness that's required to prevent yourself from getting on that snowball. Um, Otherwise, it's yeah, it's these protective factors and the protection just feels like, okay, you're totally unaware of what's going on over here. So I have to just completely take over. But as soon as you start to bring awareness to that pain, to the sensations, to the thoughts, to the feelings, and you learn that it's okay to sit with them and you're not going to crumble, that protection of pain could be like, okay, maybe I can back off a little bit and then it will test you, right? And then you might fail that test and the protector might come back and say, nope, I've got to take, you know, I've got to brace you again. I've got to put you back because you are not listening to me. And Um, so it's, it's such a, it's just learning your body's language and that really does take a mind and body approach. hundred percent. Yeah. I think being able to help lead people through that and help them kind of, you know, experience their own and kind of, kind of dig into what they're noticing. Cause I do think, yeah, you're right. Some people just disconnect from it and don't even like take inventory. We're so not mindful. And in the moment we're ruminating about what is the catastrophic outcome of what could, what I'm about to do, or they're recalling all the bad experiences in the past that just, again, 
being fully present. I mean, I use mindfulness. I think one of the things is I've gotten into acceptance commitment therapy approaches within chronic pain is just doing it on yourself. And it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm having stressful things and different like that, just to go outside and just do some noticing of like smells and just, you know, listening and, and do all these things where you just kind of be fully present in the moment, how that can really, um, help you kind of diffuse from these, like, Oh my God, you know, all these things that you knew us as normal people all go through. And I think, the I, the chronic patients I work with often are beating themselves up with, you know, th this thing like this is I'm such a failure and I have all these horrible thoughts. I think if you talk to anybody who, who's a human being, they we all deal <laughs> with chronic challenging thoughts and emotions. Maybe sometimes we have things in life that are stacked up against us that we're not coping well and able to manage them well. I mean, I've had my moments. I'm not going to say I did to where I'm not managing my stress and, and pain and, and insomnia and things like that. Um, but I think the more people can hear that this stuff is normalized and we do live in a society that, especially in the, on the male side where, you know, even speaking about feelings and emotions becomes some sort of sign of a, of a faulted male. That's not, you know, living up to the testosterone world that we sometimes try to create our own guys where, um, I, and I think sometimes that can drive a lot of pain experiences for a lot of people where they're just trying to bottle that stuff up. I work with, uh, been privileged to know some PTs who work with special forces and that the, the the environment and the culture around pain in those uh, areas are, can be pretty challenging yeah. for somebody who's dealing with a challenging pain experience. Cause you're, you're you can't show it. You got to bottle it. You got to, you, you're a threat to your unit you're a threat to the lives of the people that you're working with. So, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting just how different cultures around, even within similar, you know, you know, regions can be significantly different as far as how they view and manage pain. It's true. I think some of it might not even, this might be a little controversial, but I think some of it might not even be preventable. I think in some situations, if you're an OR doctor, I absolutely want you to bottle any emotion you have while you are cutting into my brain. Please don't let that affect your trembling in your hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like there are professions and maybe even in the military too, where you have to learn to can over control. But I wish there was more informed consent around that. Like, you're going to do a 10 year stint in the military. And after that, like your job is going to be to recover and take care of your body. Right. Like if that's your career choice, um, if that is what you're choosing, then, then you know what comes along with it. And that, and that in and of itself might even help with that experience. Um, so yeah, I just, am really big on like, we can't optimize everything. We can't have perfect. We're never going to have perfect health. Like pain experiences are going to come and they're going to go. Um, and sometimes you might even choose again to like be in something that is going to contribute to chronic pain. But if you're choosing that because it brings value and purpose and meaning to your life, well, then it's meaningful. Yeah, no, I think every, a lot of it becomes context, right? The context around pain. And if it's something that's still pointing you towards the valued goals and valued life you want to lead, I think that can be something that in, in that case, it's more of an adaptive thing. I think it's when it's really sitting us out on the sidelines and we're stopping life and we're really not having a clue of who we are or where we're pointed or, or you know, what meaning we have on a day-to-day -day existence. And I'm sure you, I know, work with, with folks who are kind of fighting some of those struggles. I think that's where, um, you know, obviously pain can become more of something we have to, you know, maybe teach people to have a little bit different viewpoint around, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely different in different contexts and it all depends on the person in front of you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That pain education piece um, is so important. But then of course, like in my line of work, we do a lot of attachment work as well. So what was it like for you when you were a child and you were in pain? Like what were the messages that you received then? Um, because if you're hearing a lot of this pain education stuff, but you just can't seem to grasp it, it's like, I, you just, I just can't, then there's probably some kind of core young experience where you were taught that whatever we're saying now about pain science and, and pain research, and there's something a disconnect there between what was safe for you to know as a kid and what you're learning now. So that's a lot of the work we do too. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't work a ton with pediatrics, but I, I always find it fascinating when I have the, you know, have the good fortune of lecturing around uh, NT. I was just in Michigan at a conference talking about it and we had a pediatric therapist in the audience. And it's always interesting because there's studies out there. One I always like to bring up is, you know, kiddos who are going through like a major thoracic kind of like orthopedic surgery it was a pretty big deal. A lot of, you know, uh, things were done. It was, I think, due to trauma. I can't remember the exact context, but regardless, um, they looked at these kiddos functional status and pain scores a year out from 
the procedure and what best predicted how well they were doing a year out was mom or dad's catastrophizing score of 24 to 40 hours after the procedure. So our kiddos and our, we learn how to adapt or cope or, or not adapt or not cope with pain by our cultures and it's family cultures, it's our workplace cultures, it's our yeah. special forces cultures of how we're supposed to react and think about pain. And I think it is hard. Yes. When somebody grows up with a message that may have folks doing some maybe maladaptive coping strategies, things that may not be the ideal way to navigate towards their value goals in life. And then we expect as clinicians to just go into that situation within a session or two and try to completely 180 that viewpoint. When that person is going to go back to that context, they're going to go back yeah. home where they might see mom or dad or brother or sister maladaptively coping. And it's just the, so it's, it's tough, you know, that, that's, it's hard. Yeah. Cause I think, and I tell this to students too, is like, I think we have some belief that we can make this. And I, I obviously we give our hundred percent effort and we, we take, you know, every situation is, um, you know, to give it the best we can, but there's sometimes people leave our context of our treatment rooms and our, our offices and they walk into a context, which is a literal haunted house full of negative messages and full of things that just pull them back into that. And then ideally, again, we create spaces where people can unpack that and, and see like that, but it, you're right. I think sometimes when we have, you know, people that are maybe looked at, you know, loved ones and things where, and that's been the cultural message that's been reinforced for decades. It's, it's a tough thing to overcome for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you are also, you know, when you're working with someone, you're looking at those fears, um, like the haunted house, you're trying to actually figure out like, what is in this person's haunted house? Mm -hmm. So not just like you came to me with back pain and the research says we treat back pain like this. It's like, well, you have back pain. And now I also need to know what horrors are in your haunted house. What are you scared of? And then we can start to actually come up with a plan. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, trying to look big picture, we talk about this whole biopsychosocial interview, because traditionally in physical therapy, we tend to interrogate the tissues, like what brings on your pain, what relieves your pain, what positions feel better, what positions feel worse. And that's still important stuff, because there can be mechanical things we can do to help people out. But you know, what do you think about your pain? Why do you think you hurt? What do you think's causing it? You know, hey, you, you're living with your family, what are their thoughts on pain? Do they do you feel like you're getting good support from them? How do where do you get your information around pain? Um, you know, what is your workplace? You know, we try to just try to understand as much of the story that's going around this pain with people, because then we can identify Ooh, there's some things there that might, you know, we need to unpack and see if that we can create some scenarios where they can, you know, evaluate that and see if that's working in the best interest of their goals. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, it's definitely a lot more than just, and it's, some people are surprised, right? Or you're, you're a physical therapist. You're going to, they think you're going to just interrogate them about their body and, and get them exercising, which is part of it. But, um, it is also just trying to get to know the unique person in front of you and the unique story they bring and see if we can pick out what are the things that might be creating that haunted house for that person. And, then you can have them, you know, break each of those down and start to take notice of when those, you know, factors are present in their life. What do they notice in their body just to start helping them see that whole mind body connection. And then, um, you know, finding some maybe constructive ways to, to, to work with it if provided it's something that's modifiable, of course, but. Yeah. Yeah. And attachment research, we talk a lot about just being seen, being heard, being soothed. Those are what kind of contribute to feeling secure. Um, and so what you're talking about here is like, even if you are focusing mostly on movement, because you're a physical therapist, just seeing the fear, just seeing the discomfort, just seeing it and, and validating it, that in and of itself, I mean, can physically relax some muscles so you can actually go in and do some work that you might not have been able to do literally five seconds ago because the person was so braced or, or whatever it is. But yeah, seeing, soothed, yeah. secure. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I think uh, it, it's always fun to see people when they let down that guard a little bit and they yeah. start to explore things without maybe as much of that on board. And then they see like they have these kind of big kind of aha light bulb moments of like, man, that feels so much better or so much different. And um, and then that usually I don't have to do a lot of motivating people to do exercises because that then becomes do that more, and especially in times where things are around you or maybe driving your body into different directions. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fun work, challenging work, but uh, definitely rewarding. 
Yes. Can we um, talk for maybe the last topic about a little bit about pain sensitization? This is such a tricky thing to talk about. I also know you've had some some big names on your podcast who are doing um, premier work in this area. Um, but I still think it, the way that I keep hearing about it spoken about on podcasts um, across across the board is there's still this underlying message of like, and even when they say, I'm not saying your pain isn't real, the message still feels like the pain isn't real. Like if you just change your thoughts about it, you're going to be fine. And I'm wondering if you can kind of speak a little bit to that. Yeah, no, I think there was a push and I probably was guilty of it myself of like really overemphasizing the brain. Um, and, and there's this thought about neurocentrism that's kind of taken hold in pain research and early on. And I think we've recognized the the faults. We're not going to educate people strictly out of pain. And then the message that becomes is like your brain's overprotective, your brain, your brain, your brain. It becomes, I mean, normal people are going to say, well, you're saying this is all my head. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I don't really use brain much. I just talk about, you know, the person and, you know, hey, you, you and your body are dealing with this. I try to use some of these analogies and things like this. Um, you know, because the sensitization, like pain sensitization processes can be obviously tissues get sensitized when they get injured. You know, that's a helpful process. We need tissues to you wouldn't want to sprain your ankle and not have any sensitivity to your ankle because you'd be still walking and, and trying to run on it. And healing would obviously be compromised. Yeah. Our, the problem becomes is when we don't recognize that there's other processes that can sensitize tissues. And that can be we call them top down processes, but they come from our central nervous system. And again, it comes from our body being a perpetual haunted house. Our, we're very sensitive. Like imagine somebody who, where you're walking on the beach at the most relaxed period of time and, and you know, you, you hear footsteps and somebody taps you on the shoulder there. No, no big deal. No, to have that same exact experience in a dark haunted house where somebody, you hear footsteps and somebody taps you on the shoulder, your body's going to have significant, your body will vary its sensitization based on context, right? You, you want to be more sensitive and reactive and things to, to the problem is the, the haunted house should go away for a lot of people. Like we shouldn't be carrying stress. And I mean, and some of the traumas we carry and some of the, you know, the negative experiences and negative thought processes that kind of pull us into that haunted house sensitized behavior. So it can be tissue driven. It can definitely be life driven <clears throat> sensitization that can really create this dysregulated system, right? I always use a TMI um, discussion just to kind of make my students laugh and my patients laugh about, you know, because oftentimes we work with patients where IBS is just part of the gig. You know, there's yep. often GI challenges that come with, because again, um, I always use the example of like, whenever I have to make big speeches or big talks in front of an audience, I used to get massively nervous. I used to have a massive yeah. challenge with social anxiety that I had to work on a lot for myself. Yeah. But I think most folks can resonate with that. When I am super nervous, I have something going on. I am in and out of the bathroom like crazy. Like my, my GI system just goes awry. And that's, again, there's a book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by <clears throat> Robert Sapolsky. He's a Stanford like uh, biologist basically, but um, talks about like how humans are the unique species that carries stress chronically. Like Zebras can get nearly eaten at a watering hole where they nearly lose their life. And then within five to 10 minutes, they are grazing on the savanna. Like life is the most serene, beautiful things. Zebras don't carry mortgage payments, feeding their families, paying bills, you know, relationships. Yeah. They, it's just humans carry this stuff and it dysregulates systems. So these, these issues that we try to then take a healthcare system that wants to take one unique piece of that very complex response. Well, it, you know, the, the GI specialist is going to look at that. Then the physical therapist is going to look at that. And then the, the, the behavioral health, and they all give different thoughts. I know hopefully not us, but, um, where if somebody can explain the whole picture of that sensitization of the human, it's a big ecosystem sensitivity thing. It's not, it can emerge in your tissues. It can emerge in your GI system. It can emerge in lack of sleep. It can emerge in a lot of different ways within a human being, but yeah, I agree. I think some of the discussions early on around sensitization, I think really became this, it's the pain is in the brain and your brain's overprotecting you. I think there's a, the, your human nature is to protect, you know, to, to survive and reproduce as if we look at it from an evolutionary perspective. So we're going to, our, our bodies are going to mount responses to threats and it's not just your brain because your brain doesn't function without senses to give it information that touch smells, sights, sounds, and things to where um, we mount these things because we embody, our brain is being fed. This thought of a sensorial and a peripheral nervous system was basically a learning tool. It's not how the body works. Our yeah. nervous system is our whole 
like our skin has all these nervous sensors, our eyes feed it. There's just a lot of things that can create sensitization of a system beyond just, you know, this brain thing that oftentimes gets, uh, I agree, gets kind of misapplied and then patients leave that discussion, you know, pretty invalidated saying this is all in my head because it's a very physical experience pain is, but it is, it's, you can't separate what's going on from your head from what's going on in your body. They, they play feed off of one another. It's not this artificial dichotomization that happens in healthcare. That's right. Yeah. I, thank you for explaining all that so well. Um, and we also, I think behaviorism is just a really bit, I mean, even, even acceptance and commitment therapy is a type of behavioral therapy, but I've never used it in that way um, where it's like, here's how we get you to do this behavior. There is behavior change within acceptance and commitment therapy, but it is very led by the client um, mm -hmm. based on what's meaningful and what's purposeful. Uh, and I think like even within some big name programs in this country that have pain clinics, um, they have, they have a behavioral approach of punitive, like rewarded and punished for doing pain behaviors. Um, and it's, it's so, I, in my opinion, it's so dangerous and it doesn't, it's not helpful. Um, so yeah, I think the sensitization conversation did become really like behavioral and you got to think this way and don't fear your pain. But again, what we're not teaching intuition and that, and if that's the conversation, we're not teaching intuition. We're not teaching you how to figure out what's right and what's good for you. We're actually just telling you what's right or what's good for you. And then you have no idea. So it's the same thing, I think with your approach to physical therapy, where it's like, does this movement feel okay? What is, what's happening here? You tell me. And so same thing with the mental health conversation, I'm never going to tell a client if a thought is rational or irrational or right or wrong or has truth to it or don't. And I, and I say that up front to clients, like, I don't know if that's true or not. And I don't care either. Does it help you move forward or does it have a negative effect on you here? Like what happens next when you have that thought or what yeah. happens next when you have that sensation? So yeah, I, that's, that's my approach. No, I would agree with you. I think there's a lot of pain rehab programs that are very founded on graded activity. This Bill Fordyce was probably the pioneer of it, where it's just this positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and all these things. Yeah, I think it can be quite rough on, uh, you know, folks for sure. And I think, you know, maybe there's a time and place, but I, I do tend to default more towards your approach where we're not judging right or wrong. We're saying, do, uh, let's look at this. Is this something that's moving you towards the life and the person you want to be? Then let's do it. That behavior looks fine to me. If it's not, then what do you think? Where do you think we can go? What are some other things we can do to maybe work on it? I can give you some su suggestions and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's, I much more enjoy the, that approach than this, I would agree, kind of more punitive approach of like, yeah. you know, wrong and right and positive and negative and, you know, these kind of, again, probably false dichotomizations that are out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would love for you to tell a little bit more about your, your, um, membership that you have sure. and, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, so obviously there's a lot of clinicians out there who are like seeing, you know, like Destiny and myself where, and not feeling very supportive because we have a lot of clinicians in healthcare environments. There's not a lot that maybe practice. It's getting more common, but um, I think it's still a lot of traditional, you know, biomechanical, physical. And again, there's not a, there's a time and a place for that. But I think for that 10 to 20 percent, some people are fortunate. They work with a group of folks like ourselves where, hey, how do you how would you work with this patient? You know, I'm seeing this. I just can't get them over this. They're really struggling to move forward. Um, what can I do to help this person where and we don't often feel like we have resources. I know I didn't. I mean, I work with some great colleagues, but they're not as nerdy and interested in pain as I am. And uh, I'm often looked as the chronic pain guy in our clinic, which is fine. But then, then who do I turn to? So um, I've tried to create a community to kind of give clinicians support to where, how do we kind of work through these skills? Selfishly, I, again, I want to get smart people. I, we have Bronnie Thompson and Mike Stewart are probably some of the, you know, really big names in our profession that are in Bronnie's an OT, Mike's a, a PT, and they're, they're really helping physical therapists who are already probably doing a great job on the tissue based examination and treatment and exercise approach. But what are you going to do with that 10 to 20%? So that's basically what the whole community is about is trying to do, you know, learning peer support and learning community where we're doing workshops and, you know, helping talk about cases, helping almost doing some sort of like impromptu, not in, informal, maybe supervision of like, okay, this is the kind of discussion. This is how our, um, you know, discussion around maybe some act 
act principles within session went and then maybe help getting a little feedback from from each other to to help it's already improved my practice just from from uh being with it and we've been fortunate we're going to open the doors we we open it quarterly just so we i have a, a group and we get kind of build the group over time and and really kind of get to know each other and and help each other in our practice so uh, it's called Modern Pain Pro. It's, it'll, I think right now, date of recording, we're in like early April here within probably mid to late April. We're going to probably open the doors for another group of clinicians. We have you in Destiny, which we very greatly appreciate it. It's not just a PT thing. Uh, we, I'd love to have OTs, uh, some of our, you know, counselors, mental health, psychology, all the folks that, uh, you know, social workers that I think we can get together to, to help each other move it forward. So that's my passion project. And then, like I said, I do the Modern Pain podcast. If you guys check that out online, um, where I try to interview smart people that can help me better understand sensitization and act, act principles and things like that. We're going to have Destiny on so she can share her expertise with the audience as well. So um, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. It's been great. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely check out um, Mark's podcast. I know just a couple episodes ago, you had someone on um, talking about like your hidden curriculum of PT, which I think is just very cool because um, yeah, then you get you as the patient, you get the insight into it. Again, it's not just some authority figure and then you have to decide if you trust or don't trust. It's like, here's what we're doing. Do you resonate with that? If so, let's go. So yeah, thanks so much for doing what you're doing. And um I look forward to keep seeing you in the community. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.